In 2015, the New York Times ran an expose titled The Price of Nice Nails. An investigative journalist revealed that manicurists in New York City are routinely underpaid, exploited, and subjected to a variety of abuses by salon owners. Maybe you remember reading this piece, but if you thought that this was merely an American phenomenon, then I have news for you. I'm a feminist anthropologist, and I work with communities of marginalized laborers in India. Much like the workers in the New York Times piece, the women that I work with are migrants from far-flung locales who come to the mainland for work. Specifically, <clears throat> they come from the Northeast region. I spent well over two years conducting multi-sided ethnographic fieldwork between the states of Manipur and Nagaland in the Northeast and the city of Bangalore in the South. During my time in the field, I spent most of my days at two local salon and spa chains. I trained alongside new arrivals and seasoned therapists, and I did everything from washing and blow-drying hair to sweeping the floor. I even tried my hand at waxing and threading, but as many of you know, threading is an art form, and I had, like, zero talent. <laughs> Frankly, I have never been as nervous as I was the first time that I was tasked with washing a customer's hair. I already stood out like a sore thumb, so I really, really did not want to mess it up. As an anthropologist, my methodology centers on immersion. I do things like deep hanging out. But to be clear, the concept of immersion is embedded in the acknowledgement that I am also always an outsider. So constant reflexivity on myself and my impact on my field site and my community of study is integral. I spent most of my days deep hanging out in the break room, where the women shared their stories as we often shared a meal. As a feminist anthropologist, I treat the experiences of women and gender as a significant means for understanding identity, culture, and difference. I listened intently as the women told me about their journeys from remote villages to the hustle and bustle of Bangalore. For many, it was the first time they had ever left their hometown, and they were excited, but understandably scared and anxious about what this journey would bring. Now, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet that's really important is that the women I work with are ethnic minorities. They are heavily recruited and desired for these positions because of their ethnic difference and perceived work ethic, which is, of course, linked to racial stereotypes, and not to mention the opportunity for exploitation, as they are vulnerable laborers in desperate need of economic opportunities. Now, their experiences of discrimination, however, go far beyond the walls of their work establishments. They are often targets of racial prejudice and physical violence, not to mention everyday, pra everyday exploitative practices, such as higher prices in local stores and in rickshaws, inability to find housing due to these same racial stereotypes, non-payment of wages, and of course, non-return of their housing deposits. They are rarely aware of their rights as citizens and don't even know the proper channels through which to seek legal redress. During my time working in the two local salons and spas that I mentioned earlier, along with partnerships with community, cross-community, and crisis management organizations, I was able to contribute to these communities in meaningful ways. Just one example is a fact-finding report that I wrote for the Northeast Association of Goa. Due to my research ex expertise, they requested me to come and investigate a situation at a local spa. Twelve female migrants from the Northeast had resigned en masse due to humiliating and exploitative work conditions. I produced an 80-plus page report that's currently being used in a legal case against a spa owner. We are hopeful that this case will set a legal precedent across India in terms of protecting vulnerable migrant laborers. Another example is a two-day interactive workshop on safe migration that I organized in Bangalore. Representatives of over 10 different organizations attended this with the intent of sharing their own experiences and, of course, taking the knowledge gained back to their communities to educate current and future migrants. So these are just a few examples of why my research is important to me and perhaps even the communities with which I work. But 
why does my research matter to you or the broader public? Well, one thing that anthropologists do really well is that we scale our work down and then we scale it back up. So what exactly does that mean? While my work focuses on a small community of migrant laborers in India, it takes very little imagination to relate this work to migrant communities across the world. We need only return to the New York Times piece from 2015 regarding nail manicurists in New York City to see the prevalence of such cases of exploitation, discrimination, and violence. At a time when migration seems like such a vexed political act, and migrant communities, especially in this country, are being targeted in new ways, I see my work as part of a much broader conversation regarding marginality and structural violence that we urgently need to have. Thank you.